Hi, welcome back to General Chemistry 2. My name is Chuck White, and today's lesson is on entropy and equilibrium. We're going to talk about how spontaneous or irreversible chemical processes always increase the entropy of the universe. We'll talk about the concentration dependence of the Gibbs free energy, and we'll talk about equilibrium and the law of mass action. And finally, we'll end today's lesson with a discussion of Le Chatelier's principle, which deals with the response of a system that is disturbed from equilibrium. Now we know already that there are two main driving forces for reaction, enthalpy and entropy. Exothermic reactions uh, drive the uh, reaction toward products, uh, and reactions that have delta S greater than zero um, also drive uh, reactions toward the formation of products. And we also know that the heat released by a chemical reaction must be transferred to the surroundings if we're to maintain a constant temperature. So the ent entropy of both the system and the surroundings has increased uh, in an exothermic reaction like this, because delta S uh, must be equal to Q over T, delta S of the surroundings must be equal to Q over T, and Q that goes to the surroundings uh, is minus delta H for the reaction. So recall that the Gibbs free energy is delta, e, delta G for the system is equal to delta H minus T delta S for the system at constant pressure and temperature. And because the delta S of the universe is equal to the sum of delta S for the system and the surroundings, we can use uh, the uh, expression on the last slide to say that delta S is equal to delta S for the universe is equal to delta S for the system minus delta H for the system divided by T. But now using the definition of the Gibbs free energy change, that's just minus delta G over T. And so we have a direct relationship between delta S of the universe and delta G of the system. And that says that if delta G of the system is less than zero, then the reaction is spontaneous and irreversible, and the entropy of the universe is greater than zero. Now by definition, the Gibbs free energy is H minus Ts, and we can expand this uh, to say that it's U plus PV minus Ts. And then we can write a differential form of the Gibbs free energy by expanding out the differentials of all of these different terms. And by using a couple of tricks, uh, we can say that dq reversible is equal to Tds, that's just the definition of entropy in its differential form. And uh, by imposing constant temperature conditions, we can make the last term go away, and a couple of the middle terms go away because they're equal and opposite sign. Uh, then we can write that dg is equal to vdp, and by using the ideal gas law we can re rewrite this as rt dp over p or rt d log p. And so by integrating this equation we can say, see the delta g of formation for any substance must be equal to the delta g zero of formation, and this is just a constant of integration now, plus rt log of p divided by one bar. More generally, if we write uh, the delta G as delta G zero plus RT log of A, where A is the thermodynamic activity, we understand that for gases, particularly ideal gases, A is just equal to P divided by uh, one bar, and A is equal to C for solutes divided by uh, one mole per liter. And so the thermodynamic, thermodynamic activity, A, has the same numerical value as the pressure or the concentration, but it has no units, and that's because the reference state always has unit value, one bar or one mole per liter. Now look at the uh, hypothetical reversible reaction, A plus B goes to C plus D. Delta G for the reaction is just going to be the delta G of formation for the products divided by delta G of formation for the reactants, and we can use our delta G equation for each substance to rewrite the delta G for reaction as the delta G zero for the reaction. That is to say, the superscript zero means under standard conditions of one bar or one mole per liter. But then we can add a correction uh, to say the delta G is delta G zero plus RT log of um, PC PD divided by PA PB. So now we can calculate delta G at any partial uh, value of partial pressures. And now at equilibrium, delta G 
for the reaction is equal to zero, and so we can re re rearrange this equation to say that delta G zero, which is a constant, we can just look up the values in a table, is equal to minus RT log of the ratio of pressure, partial pressures at equilibrium conditions. And because all of this is equal to a constant, we can rewrite that, that as minus RT log of K, where K is the ratio of equilibrium partial pressures. Now, uh, the ratio of equilibrium partial pressures is equal to a constant, as we've just seen. It's always structured as the partial um, pressure of the uh, products divided by the partial pressure of the reactants, or concentrations if we have solutes. The absolute pressures are actually irrelevant, and it's only the ratio of pressures, or more properly thermodynamic activities, that determines the equilibrium condition. If the measured ratio of pressures is not equal to K, then the system is not at equilibrium. So this allows us to define a reaction quotient, which we'll call Q. And under any particular experimental conditions, we can calculate the ratio of activities of products and reactants. If we're dealing with gases, then it would be partial pressures of the products divided by partial pressures of the reactants. And we know that if Q is less than K, if the value, numerical value of Q is less than the equilibrium constant, then delta G must be less than zero, and the reaction will proceed forward spontaneously until Q is equal to K. And likewise, if Q is less than K, then the reaction will go backwards toward reactants until the point is reached where Q is equal to K. And so the reaction always goes in a direction toward the equilibrium state. Now let's look at Le Chatelier's principle. Any system that's disturbed from equilibrium will react in a way that tends to minimize the effects of that disturbance. Now let's take for example the reaction of N2O5 uh, to produce NO2 and half a mole of O2. This reaction is endothermic, so delta H is greater than zero, and uh, delta S for this reaction is greater than zero also. We can actually tell that by inspection because there are two, mo two and a half moles of gas on the product side and only one on the reactant side, so it's pretty clear that entropy has increased. Now if we increase the temperature, the forward reaction is endothermic and that consumes heat, and so we can think of heat as um, a pseudo-reactant in this case, and uh, the effect of increasing temperature will be to drive the reaction in the forward direction toward products. If we add NO2 instead, then what we've done is we've increased Q relative to K, and what that will do is drive the reaction backwards toward reactants until Q has um, decrease to the value of K. In effect, you're reducing the uh, partial pressure of NO2 and O2, and you're increasing the partial pressure of N2O5 until Q is equal to K. If we reduce the volume, what that does is um, it increases the pressures of everything. And uh, because there are two and a half moles of uh, reactants and only uh, two and a half moles of products and only one of reactants, it's going to increase Q relative to K. And so again, the reaction is going to go in the reverse direction, reducing the pressures of the products and increasing the pressures of the reactants until Q again reaches the value of K. Next time, we will consider entropy, the second law, and heat engines. <laughs>